Um, this is day two of our um, back to school event, and I am just going to start off by asking who did their homework. And if you remember back to last uh, Friday, um, we spent quite a bit of time discussing uh, the ideas behind sort of planning a lesson, uh, both at the really big scale that Darren talked about uh, and at the sort of the lesson level that I talked about. Um, we spent a bit of time talking about specifically the SAMA model, um, which I know most people are familiar with, but often we don't dig into. And I think we digged into it a little bit deeply the other day, hopefully, um, and got you thinking a bit of it. Um, the thing I asked you guys to do, uh, which was to consider some of your own current activities, tasks and assignments, um, how would you rate them? Where are they currently on the SAMA scale? Uh, so you remember back last week, we did an activity where I put you into groups and asked you to sort out some um, hypothetical activities into different levels of the SAMA scale. Uh, and so I guess I'm asking you to turn that around now and look at your own activities and say, where do you think they are? And how could you modify it or reinvent it to be better? Because if you remember, we, we threw this list up on the screen um, as identifying some of the characteristics of a higher level task. Uh, and again, I want to reiterate that you know, when we talk about the SAMA model, it is never four little neat boxes that things fit into. It is a continuum. And, and I, I think it would be unreasonable to expect that everything you do is at the redefinition level all the time. That's just, that would break you, honestly. Um, but, uh, you know, I think the idea of it is a lens to look through at the work you're giving students to do uh, and considering, like, where is it in terms of um, meaningful use of technology. So these were the characteristics we proposed at the, and on Friday, you know, the idea that it's a rich task, it has connections beyond and outside the classroom, um, it connects students with real data, it's authentic, speaks to a real audience, has a clear purpose, um, offers choice and voice for students, um, offers a variety of different tools and platforms, and is difficult or impossible to do without the use of technology, and of course uses the four C's of communication, collaboration, creativity, and creative thinking. So that's kind of the, the lens we looked at. Now I'm gonna throw it over to you. Would anyone like to volunteer to sort of put their hand up and just tell us um, what they came up with? Uh, Bindi, thank you. And I'm gonna thank Bindi particularly because I know she doesn't like speaking, but um, thank you for doing it anyway. Well, it's usually because my voice disappears when I get onto the technology part of things. Um, so yeah, it was a year 12 task. Um, obviously my homework was done not on the weekend. Uh, I was very busy uh, trying not to drown. Um, so we had uh, a unit uh, on DNA replication and uh, working out um, what mutations occur, how they occur and what sort of um, issues they cause. Uh, once they've um, gone through the whole process. Uh, so in order for the kids to understand uh, how DNA replication works, they had to create a model of DNA and then insert their um, problem that they were discussing, their mutation or mutagen, whatever uh, was the cause, and describe how that impacted the end result, which was the mutation. Um, and originally it, it went through so many iterations it wasn't funny um i'd had i have more than a quarter of the class living with anxiety so i had to cut out the present presenting the model to the class and explaining how it worked so we we went to okay then they can film uh that and then they can present the film in class um so Fast forward, we had no presentation of the film in class. I just played them and gave them the kids a critique sheet, marking criteria uh, for them to write down the marks that they thought each film deserved and what um, caused them to, to write those things down or what they, why they, or justify why they made those marks with comments. Um, and then that was paired with uh, a pre-course, pre-test, sorry, formal feedback session um, with a, a workbook uh, so that they could research the task 
um, and they had to obviously provide a bibliography which had more than uh, three URLs and uh, different sources and do a stoplight on on um, the uh, feasibility of each okay. resource. And this, this is the reader's one task you're talking about now, right? Yeah, so it kind of like, uh, it, it, it went through the initial stage of uh, do set up this DNA and pair it up and then uh, describe uh, what you did through uh, present it to the class through a video which some of which I could not play in the classroom. Um, I was only allowed to watch them. They weren't allowed for anybody else to see. Um, and then uh, the formal feedback session, they actually had to, on paper, pair up um, a line of, of DNA and its complementary strand and then the mRNA so that um, a limited mistake occurred. Uh, so it was like a, all these threads going through and the bottom line was they had to understand how DNA, DNA replication worked and all of the processes involved and what causes the mutation. Nice. Thank you for sharing that. I am just going to go That's into that previous slide over here uh, and make a copy of that slide because I keep, otherwise I'll keep flipping back to it. Let me just go down here and drop it right there. Um, Okay, because I just want to pick out some of the things I think I heard you say, which was, you know, you've tried to turn it into a rich task. It's got, it's more complex. They're doing more things. They're, 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 you've involved video, you've involved the, the research uh, in the beginning, but the feedback cycles and giving each other peer feedback. So, yeah, you've turned it into a much more complex task, much more rich. They're using different tools. Um, and I guess that authenticity is, you know, even though you've, You've got a small audience because you said you weren't allowed to show it outside of the school, outside of the classroom, but at least now it becomes an audience for each other, not just the teacher. Yeah. 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 So that's great. Yeah, thank you for some, sharing. Some of them have allowed, I can share it with the faculty um, so it can be used for other groups as a teaching tool um, because some of them got 15 out of 15 for their, their um, model and their video. Uh, they just, they were amazing. Did you find the quality of the presentations over video was was of a good standard? Oh yeah, like yeah. I was, I, nobody failed. They all hit all of the markers that were in there, and it was quite a complex um, marking criteria. I had several factors in each section. Well, let um, me ask you: Do you, in your view, do you think that the presentations that they did on video were? different in any way to what they would have done had they stood up in front of the class and done it face to face oh yeah 100 percent. they yeah. like some of them did such a good job um and they as in, as in putting more work voice. into it or con yeah. being more concerned yeah. with how they communicated because yeah. they started off they were supposed to do a 3d model and then get up and show the 3d model and how it worked in class and then they'd already done a model for chemistry and some of the physics kids had done models and they went where we don't want to do a model. So I had to kind of okay. think on my feet and keep like, and so it just kept evolving into this um, much more complex task that they didn't realize was much more com complex until nice. after they'd done it. Nice. So yeah, it was a good task. Thanks, Bindi, appreciate you sharing that. That's awesome. Um, nice. Do we have anyone else who would like to? Well, first of all, can we give Bindi a, a round of virtual applause? Yay, look at all those on the screen. Um, anyone else would like to offer uh, some thoughts? Uh, Julia, you have your hand up. Hi, everyone. Um, I made a really short task, which is just part of a, an, a VCE English language lesson. Um, it's on slide number seven of that slide deck. Um, oh, yeah. You probably actually need to see it because there are links in it and you need to... Uh, where did I... Oh, I made a copy. Um, hang on. I'll, I'll keep talking. I will find okay. it. Um, so one of the things you learn in English language is the IPA or the International Phonetic Alphabet. And um, students need to get an idea. We need to transfer their thinking from spelling and letters towards sounds because sometimes a sound has almost nothing to do with the letter um, or the letter combinations. 
So we get them to, we had a very bland, boring task, which was really just have a look at this IPA chart. Uh, it's in their books. Or we often just put one up on the screen. So it was very, very basic and figure out how to write your name with uh, using that chart, the one on the left there. Um, what am I saying about this? So uh, what I did was change it so that if you go to that link, if someone wants to go to it, it's quite fun. Um, you press on different buttons and you another top one. Oh, See, top very one. Top row, step one. I would I, I would make this in a doc because um, at year 11, they're new into VCE and they need to learn to work quickly. So we we're, we push them with time. So I love to embed the smart chips. You can embed a little timer yep. to try and help guide them, certainly in semester one of year 11, to, you know, this should only take you five minutes. This should take you seven minutes. That, you know. um, so if you go to that top link, what? This, this one here? In under oh, number sorry. one. Uh, so, uh, yes, sorry, I need to share that tab. There you go. If you press on any of those bright green... Um, uh, you go... <laughs> did you get the audio on that? And keep scrolling, scroll down further, and then you'll get different things. So if you press, uh, go down ja, to... Uh, yeah. ja. Go down to fricatives, and the second from the bottom on the right, voiced um, alveolar palatial fricative. Cha. A cha. So they look at all of these symbols and just using sounds, not using letters, they figure out how da, to a da. write their name. I, I, I got to say, Julia, just by way of side note, I, in, a, in an information which would surprise nobody in this room, I'm such a nerd that when I was at school, I learned in International Phonetic Alphabet and actually learned to write fluently in it. I've forgotten most of it now, but um, I love this stuff. It's so... It's awesome. You, um, look, I, I've, I teach at a really specific school with very specific children. You know, one of them recently wrote me a letter uh, in, in semaphore, you know, flag sign. Yep, like yep. they do things like that. Anyway, this is just part of the study design and they learn um, about phonetics. So if you go back to the, so they play around with that for a bit and they write their name. Yep. Um, which again, it's that shift away from seeing it on the page. It's it's a shift towards really hearing it. Yep. Um, then they, you know, they would classify them as voiced or unvoiced or plosive nasal, fricative, all of that. Oh. Then they'll go into um, YouTube and uh, find their name pronounced in different ways. And then I give them an example of my name. I write how I how I pronounce it. But I did mm -hmm. live in the Netherlands for a while, where they instead of saying Julia, they say Julia. Mm -hmm. And then I get them to work together. So I think oh, it's really. Can I, can I say this um, one? What's this one? Oh. Oh, that's just a video of my name. Oh, it's just a sample? Yeah, yeah. We you can, are uh, looking at how to pronounce that. this name as well as how to say <laughs> more interesting <laughs> and often miss. You don't need to watch that. Um, and then they will make a recording of their name. So they'll pair up with someone else. Look, there are many ways that I will extend this if if it's going really well or if someone's got um, a very simple name that doesn't have complicated sounds, I get them to look for words. But we're very fortunate. You know, we've got a high uh, population of Southeast Asian students with really beautiful and amazing names. So it's um, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, but that yeah, should yeah. totally take 15 minutes. So I would say it's modification it's not redefinition it's exactly the same task but just deeper and richer and a little bit global that's okay you you've nudged it along the continuum and that's what matters yeah. right yeah awesome thank you for sharing that's great like i said i am an ipa nerd so i love this stuff <laughs> um all right virtual clap for julia for julia <laughs> uh thanks um uh, dom you've got your hand up yep i'm happy to share Go for it, my friend. You want to open slide five, please? Yeah, sure. Uh, let me go back to slide five. Yeah. Um, I've left the links in there, Chris. I might, um, they're just too long to transfer in. Could I get yeah, you no, on? I did take a look at them before. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the previous computing task, which I hasten to add wasn't designed by me, literally was calculated to kill any enthusiasm. 
Um, this was for a year 11 computing class. Um, the unit in question in the syllabus is actually designed to kill any enthusiasm that anyone might have. Um, it's probably one of the most boring units I've ever come across. Um, I, I openly tell my students you couldn't you couldn't make this unit exciting with four million volts and a cattle prod. Um, but and it's also the one that requires fifty percent of the course content. As it was in its um, in its version that's on the screen on the left, it actually was a series of step questions, um, which was about as boring as anything. The only thing it did was it minimised um, plagiarism, but it meant that I had to mark an absolute lot of work and it was nothing more than question answer. Um, God, it was boring. <laughs> um, so this is, this is it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, just totally, you look at it, I look at it now and I'm going, my God, that's horrifying. That the only question that actually nudged it into the more difficult, if you can go up to the next page, please. 20. I love how all the primary teachers in the room are looking at that going, what the? <laughs> uh, go to the other one. Uh, to question 22 on that oh, one, please, Chris. Sorry, question, question 22, sorry, let me go back. This is the next page. <laughs> uh, sorry, question, come on, light up. Right down the bottom. Oh, there's another page, okay, yeah. all right. So Question 22, yeah. Two, that was the one. only one that had any possible um, move out of just substitution and we were starting to get um, blooms. You were probably about level three, level four there. You're, you're starting to get assess and analyse. Um, I realised that, one, the unit... I was teaching was boring. I was teaching it in a boring way um, and my students were totally disengaged. So I actually had to walk completely away from the unit and reanalyze the whole of what I wanted. And so the redefined prelim computing task, please. Yep. Was designed with, with direction in mind. So, the first part of it is very, very um, structured. They'll be divided into five groups, input, process, output, storage and control. There's a series of questions for each of those that they have to address. But then what they're doing is using either slides or sites or another... Um, Presentation uh, tool. Yeah, of their presentation tool of their choosing, they're actually constructing the notes for that section that they're based on those questions that they are then going to teach the students in the class. Yep. And those notes then all got mashed by me at the end into a set of unit notes that went out to all the students. So effectively, not only are they learning their own section very effectively, they're actually getting the students doing the teaching. Yeah, that's and that works so much better. Mr. Rosen, you have your hand up. This is about this. Oh no, I'll, um, I I added a slide. Oh, so oh, Miss Miss Rosen, sorry, sorry, yeah, that's right. Miss, right. <laughs> Miss, sorry. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, that's thanks, Dom, for sharing that. That's uh, it, it. Always, it's such a simple flip to 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 take the production of information, like even just notes and stuff, and just make the students do it rather than you do it for them. But it's it's back to the like one of the things Gary Steger said billions of years ago. Why are we so afraid to let our children teach? Mm. Mm. And it's it's sat with me for years, and it's the thing that um, more and more drives everything I do. Yeah. No, if, if the teacher's the one going home tired at the end of the day, the wrong person's been doing the work. Yep. <laughs> uh, all right, thanks for sharing, mate. I uh, appreciate it. Um, we, I'm just mindful of time. We probably have time for one more, if anyone would like to share. So we've had something from science, we've had something from computing, and both have been senior. Have we got any people in the primary uh, sphere that would like to share something? Um, uh, Ms Rosen, you did have your hand up. Would you like to talk? 
Uh, yeah, look, I just, I did, um, it's the bare bones of something that I'm working on. Sure. Um, and it's on slide number eight. Eight? Yes. Oh, eight would be, um, no, I'll have to kick it over here to see the numbers, hang on. Uh, eight, that one. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, I am in a very, I suppose, one of the poorest areas of Sydney. Um, mm -hmm. We have a high... Um, there's a big mob Aboriginal community there, um, right. a lot of Pacific Island communities. Um, and technology is something probably that they, a lot of students mainly access in the classroom. Well, more extended use of technology. So the challenge for me is um, uh, literacy is an issue, obviously, and also digital literacy. So the challenge is actually developing their tech skills whilst also developing the kind of crucial skills that I'm trying to teach, which is around literacy and comprehension um, and writing, yes, reading, writing. Um, so um, we're doing this unit of work on memory, memoir, um, story, and um, one the main set text is Growing Up Aboriginal in Australia. I've put yeah. a link there. There's like a Google book that has a great deal of that um, anthology available. Um, so, again, this, I'm rewriting this unit anyway. It wasn't really, it hasn't really been um, used for a long time, but we have many copies of this in our book room. Um, so <clears throat> the original, this is just look, the final summative task is an independent writing task, in-class writing, low-tech, high-value. Um, so the work, this is part of the learning work leading up to the end of the unit. Um, so the original idea is <clears throat> we share, we we study, we read together and study one story, um, and then maybe they could do a web quest on um, the kind of area or country that the writer is situated in in that narrative, um, <clears throat> and do a shared jam board um, on the research and then um, the ideas of how that the, the findings relate to the composer's experiences in the narratives. And then in terms of the SAMA model, um, similar process, we share, read one story, we do questions about the location, a bit of a web quest, but then move into small groups and each group pick a different story um, and I hopefully make sure that they have time to actually read it together. Um, and then uh, they... And this is where I wanted to get some ideas from other people. Like I know on Google Earth, students can create itineraries or journeys or something. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I, I was thinking um, I would ask them as a group, each group, to develop a journey based on the kind of country or location or, or something connected to country um, from the story. And then in that, um, embed, like, uh, because I'm not, like, that experienced in Google Earth, um, can they embed some of their insights into this journey or trek or whatever you call it that relate to the um, meaning in the story or the connection of growing up in this area to the, to the kind of journey that they develop? Yeah, I love that idea. And yes, you can in Google Earth. You've got the ability to create what's called voyages, where you voyages. can actually map out yeah. pins. Okay. And within each of those pins, you can attach your own photos and your own stories and your own text and yes. everything to those pins. Fantastic. So you could mark out locations on the on the map and sort of literally tell the story through the map. Okay, that's great. So they're called voyages. Yeah, it's just a, it's just a section inside Google Earth. Okay, um, thank you. Is it called voyages or projects, Steve? Did they change the name? There's a project. Uh, yeah. Yeah, project, 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 yeah, right. project. Yeah, project. Yeah, projects. Yeah, projects. Not That's sure if it's on Earth, but um, you can also upload 360 photos on a lot of the different ones as well, and you can film 360 with most modern smartphones. So you could do a full immersive view and have that uploaded as well. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Right. Lots of cool ideas there. Thank yep. you for sharing. That's really that's really great. Thanks, Ms. Rosen. Um, and I, I said that would be the last one, but Alfina, you are uh, you at the other end of the spectrum with the primary early years and stuff. Can you do yours in five minutes? 
I can, yes. Okay, all right. <laughs> um, uh, though I picked the Stage Story one to do because um, I'm re joining Stage Story after two years. So um, I taught this unit two years ago when I first arrived at this school and um, sort of just buddied along with my other RFF teacher. And um, they, the original task was they filled in a Google slide template, did a bit of a research task and answered a few questions and that was it. Um, but now I'm on my own and I'm rewriting the unit. So um, they're looking at, um, the outcome looks at food and, food and fibre and agriculture in Australia. So um, yes, Mary, we could do something together. <laughs> same diocese um so i thought they can use um farm uh, vr so we've still got the from the old exhibition uh, expeditions but we can use farm vr app or we could use um youtube vr and have a look at um one of the farms that the children choose um working in small groups um they can then use um google my maps to create a digital map showing the export and import locations of their particular um produce that they pick so um they can do an interactive map um, insert comments with export data if they happen to find it um and then in a spreadsheet they can enter the data about how much water their choice of export or import um their agricultural uses so how much to raise cattle how much water is used each month if they can collect that data um, and then with all their tabs they can create a screencast using their Chromebook um, and edit that in Canva because we have Canva access and Canva allows that collaborative, uh, collaborative editing um, then their video can be put into a shared slide deck where other students then comment with those same questions they can either see if they can answer those questions so if they've done cattle they might go to the oyster um, to the oyster or prawn video and um, see if they can answer those questions using comments on the side or offer feedback to that group to say right I can't quite see this answer going back and then allowing students to look at the feedback and edit and add their videos accordingly um, using um, the feedback process model. So that's a quick version. Thank you. That's awesome. I love the fact that, and I know you and I know each other quite well, and I know like the stuff you do, but I, a lot of teachers look at that and go, you did that with year three? Like, I don't do that's that with year eight. Three, stage three. That's year five, six. That's year five, six. Stage oh, year five, six, five, six. Still, yeah. like, you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's, yeah. And again, coming back to the characteristics of high-level tasks, like you've made it more complex, you've made it richer by involving more things and more components that they have to work and interactions between the two, you've made it more authentic. Um, you know, you're giving the kids the choice to work amongst different different tools to express their learnings. So yeah, great work. Great work, everyone. Thank you for sharing. Can we give everybody a big round of applause for that sharing? Um, and look, if, if if you also did the homework and you put something in that deck and we did not get to you today, uh, my apologies was just, we just don't have time to get through it all today. But do take a look at that deck. Um, uh, my bad, I think when I pushed it out, it was originally read only. And uh, some people actually made copies of, of the page and they did it that way. So um, but that's good. But it is open for editing now. So if you want to go and have a look through that deck, um, it is all there. Um, thanks, thanks everyone for sharing. That's amazing. Uh, I think I can go back to these slides. Can I go back to these slides? Hmm. No, oh, I'll stop sharing there. <laughs> I've got so many things going on here. Um, so, baby, Kimberly, would you like to uh, get ready to do your bit? Do you want me to share? Uh, I've, I've got the slides, or you can share if you want. I'm, I'm going to stop sharing, so you may as well start. Okay, sure. I can start sharing. So um, Emily's going to talk to us about artificial intelligence and uh, AI and BARD and some of the cool things that Google's going on in the AI space at the moment, and particularly how it relates back to education. Um, I, you know, I'm a big believer in the creativity of teachers. I think we've just seen great examples of what happens when you get a creative teacher starting to really think more deeply about the learning experience of their students and how they design those learning experiences. But um, there's no doubt that AI will have an impact on what we do in our profession. Uh, and so Kimberly's going to tell us a bit about that and frame it for us. Over to you. 
Sure. I, I like your intro because I don't actually have all those things that you just told everybody I was going to talk about in my in my little session, but that's fine because we have lots of, <laughs> lots of creative things. Uh, so hi, everyone. Um, I am going to talk a little bit about AI and I'm actually going to start with a, a little activity that has um, I guess just sort of feeling out where the room is at. So AI is being borderline impossible to avoid as a topic in education or anywhere really for the last 15 months since ChatGPT um, sort of launched publicly. Um, and I, I had lots of conversations with lots of different school leaders and system leaders around how they're feeling about AI. And so I wanna do a check-in on where we're feeling about AI in education at this point. Um, I'm going to just set the protocol that this is a, a brave space so you can be honest here um, and that there is no right answer. But what I want you to do is I'm going to share something called an emotion quadrant. And if you've never seen this used before, this is actually, you'll probably all love this as, as educators. The first time I ever saw this, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to use it all the time from this point forward. Um, what I'm going to do is put this emotion quadrant up on the screen. And if you Google emotion quadrant, you'll find this online. And what I want you to do is, is when you think about AI in education right now, what emotion uh, is strongest for you as a reaction to the idea that AI and education are an unavoidable force um, of the current and the future state? So here's our emotion quadrants. So we have on the top right hand corner, high energy, high pleasantness sort of emotions. Uh, we have low energy, high pleasant though in the green area. We have high energy, low pleasantness in our red area uh, and low pleasantness, uh, low pleasantness and low energy in our blue area. So have a read. I'm just gonna give you uh, two minutes to read through all of the emotions that are listed on the screen. And I want you to try and pick, I know last time I did this as an activity last week with um, a group of leaders and uh, they basically immediately told me picking one was impossible. So try your best to like narrow it down to a top two emotions that the idea of AI and education sort of brings to light for you. Okay, by way of emoji thumb up, who's managed to sort of narrow down to one or two emotions? Okay, awesome. All right. Um, <laughs> um, let's, um, uh, if we had more time, we would, um, what I've done in the past is actually put people into, uh, you know, like think, pair, share kind of groups and actually talk this through. Um, but what we might do is actually just get a bit of a gauge of where we're sitting as a collective group. And what I'd like you to do is open the chat on the right hand side and just put not your emotion, but your color quadrant into the chat. So red, yellow, blue, or green for your most prominent emotion when you think about AI in education. And in, in, I think in our top, in our first four, we covered all four quadrants too. Okay, lots of yellows, lots of, quite a few reds, quite a lot of blues. Not as many greens, nobody's sort of like feeling zen. <laughs> That's not super shocking to me, I'll tell you. Um, anybody um, uh, feeling really torn between two colour quadrants and you sort of flip between the two? If you are, just like Ms Rosen's done in the chat, can you put the two colour quadrants that you flip between uh, in there? Yellow and green. Yellow and red. Yellow and red. Blue and red, interesting, red and blue, 
green and red, yellow and green. <laughs> I like Ryan that you put qualifiers for why you're sitting in um, those uh, quadrants too. So it's it's really interesting. This is such an interesting activity um, to do with groups of um, school leaders and teachers even because the reality is that AI, like for me personally, I 100% want to just solely sit in the yellow quadrant and the emotion that stands out for me immediately is optimistic um, around like what the potential this has in a positive way. Um, but when I talk to a lot of people, it, it's interesting to see so many people in the blue in this group because you guys are joining um, some professional learning run by a technology company in your non-teaching time, which suggests that you are probably not the norm to start with and you're probably more engaged in technology than the average people. And the feedback that we've got from lots of people is people are starting to sit in that blue section a little bit because they're kind of tired and exhausted and it's really hard to keep up with what's going on in AI. And I'll give you permission right now to be okay with and accept that nobody is an expert in AI. Even our AI experts aren't an expert in AI because it is moving and evolving at such a pace and such a rate that it's not actually possible to kind of be an expert at all times. Um, and then there's a lot of reds that I saw um, in our group too. And I know that that's that whole unknown for us. Like as teachers, we're sort of train to be able to quantify things with grades and metrics and things like that and it's hard to do that in some of these spaces and that makes a whole lot of emotions um, actually surface to the top too. Um, what we might do as a final thing if everybody is comfortable to do so can you write into the chat the actual emotion that if you had to just pick one that right now when you think about AI and education what emotion is, is front of mind for you tip of your tongue. You can't do that, Dave. <laughs> okay, can I just say how, like, I don't think I've ever had people add to a chat as quickly as you all did. It's like you all were like, let me tell you my actual emotion. Stop talking so I can type that in. So interesting, right, to see the complete um, huge diversity in the way that people are thinking about and feeling about AI um, in education. And as I said, you know, this is coming from a group of, um, a, you know, highly motivated individuals to be joining this professional learning in your holidays. So it's something to really help um, ground yourself when you're thinking about, okay, well, all of these new tools are coming out and like, what are we going to embrace this year that's really going to help to transform? And like Chris was talking about moving us up the SAMA model in terms of um, the technology's use of uh, in, in our um, pedagogy throughout the year. But like, be okay with the fact that people are probably sitting in the red section sometimes that you're going to be trying to convince to do that. And some of them are in the blue section and some of them in the green section because they're potentially also living in this nice little world where they've actively chosen to block out a lot of the noise and the hype um, around it as well. Um, so it's a, it's it means that we have to be really cognizant of um, everybody's in a different space, even those of us who we would normally like, hey, new technology that has this potential to be amazing. Most of the time in the past, I feel like everyone would have been in the yellow section, but because AI is so new, so different, um, and really pushes us in many ways, really every single time of every group of people I've ever done this with, it's been this huge divergence um, in feelings towards it. So what I'm gonna do um, today uh, in a pretty brief period of time, so um, happy to um, chat further about it at another time if people have an interest in doing so, is do a little bit of, um, a little bit of history of the AI story because it's quite good to talk a little bit about where we come from, um, talk a little bit about um, how AI principles and we think about them because Google has some, but so does every tech company is developing AI and if they don't, you probably don't want to be using the AI that's being developed by them. Um, how that actually applies in the education space uh, and why this all matters in education in terms of helping us to move from the probable future to the preferable future um, and our role in that. And I'm going to try and do that 
um, pretty quickly, which anybody who knows me well is, is like laughing about the fact that I'm trying to get through slides quickly. Yeah, so I was just going to say Darren still needs to do a section on his um, bit, so just be mindful of the time. Sure. All right. So some of you have seen slides like this before, but I'm going to give you a little bit of a history, and this is from Google's perspective, obviously, around AI. So back in 2015, um, Google's DeepMind developed something called AlphaGo, and this was the product that beat the top chess players. Um, Go players, sorry, Go, that's what's got AlphaGo. Um, and this was like the first time that people were like, wait a second, a computer is starting to outsmart people. What's happening? Um, and so this was what? I got to work out the maths of that. And that took me a long time to work out what the maths. That's only eight years ago, nine years ago, we're in 2024, right? Hmm. Um, uh, but it sort of changed the way people are thinking about what this AI might be able to do because there's a lot of um, predictive analysis happening in that. Jump forward to 2017 uh, and Google invented the first transformer. And we've now all heard the word transformer. We see it as the T that sits in chat GPT. Um, and this sort of really kickstarted the large language model revolution. Does anyone know what the first transformer was actually developed? What problem Google was trying to solve when they developed the transformer? Not you, Chris Betcher. That's my sufficient teacher wait time. Uh, it was actually developed um, for Google Translate. So they developed the transformer because they actually wanted to be able to take an entire sentence and translate it. So it was as much about the context and the semantics in the sentence as it was about the actual physical words. And so this was a new model or type of technology that was needed for them to actually be able to do that really effectively. So Google invented the transformer. We actually open sourced it. Um, and then that sort of really kickstarted the whole large language model uh, revolution all around the world. Um, in 2018, uh, we learned, launched the world's first la language model, BERT. Um, and it was actually at that point being integrated into Google Search for language processing. So um, for many years, you've been able to type into search kind of borderline incoherent questions and sentences. And it's um, actually that language model that sat behind search and actually interpreted what you were not just explicitly saying, but what you might be saying as well there. Um, jumping all the way forward um, to 2020, where this um, particular diagram finishes, um, and there's been incredible leaps forward with AI in the medical world. So AlphaFold was able to, and I can't remember, Betty, you probably remember the number of proteins or something that it was able to actually synthesize and analyze in comparison to teams Billions. of scientists. Billions. Billions, um, and so they 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 moved forward in terms of medical research, um, basically decades and decades in a matter of minutes um, because of this technology. So for a long time, we've been doing interesting things in this space, um, and it's sort of now starting to see the evolution of that, where it's no longer sitting separate to us in education; it's very much embedded in it. Um, concurrently, this has actually been built into workspace for a long time. And you'll see um, around that 2018 mark where we saw Transformers, remember, um, kicked in in 2017, you'll actually see that the AI tools within Google Workspace start to get a little bit more generative-like. So even though we weren't necessarily labelling it that way, if you think about things like Smart Compose, like it's predicting the next word in your sentence. And this is because we had the technology like transformers to sit behind it. Um, and so not just, you know, use AI for spam detection, but actually use AI from that generative sort of space. Now, when we're thinking about AI at Google and in education, we sort of break it into three things. And this is really important from all of our perspectives because we are working in the education space to really draw clear lines here. So Google has, like I just said, you know, we've been doing AI for a long time. They've made some amazing inroads. And I say we definitely had nothing to do with any of that. But the really smart people who are our colleagues have. Um, and we've launched some really awesome stuff. So the right section here, when we talk about Google Bard, um, this is one of our consumer products. And what I mean by that is that this is available to anyone online, but it's not designed or um, deliberately um, 
created for education. That means that doesn't sit within our workspace for education um, terms of service, so it doesn't meet our criteria for that. It's not saying that it's bad, but in education, we have incredibly high, as we should, and rigorous standards and protocols that we have to meet, and our consumer products sit separate to that. By all means, as a teacher, if you feel that the terms of service are fine for you, you should use it but it does not meet the criteria for your, your students to be using at this point in time. On the blue side of this, we have our enterprise versions of AI. And what we mean by that is that um, the best analogy I've heard is like Google when it comes to AI is a bit like Bunnings. Like legitimately you could walk into this huge warehouse and be like, I want four of them, six of them, and I want it to do this. And you pick all the components that you want and somebody much smarter than me would build it for you. Okay, so we have incredible AI that can be developed, can be built. Things like the AlphaFold stuff that we talked about, like that's all building on what's possible. And there are so many amazing examples. If we had more time, we'd go into um, over in the blue section. The bit that I want us to try um, and get excited about as well is the yellow section. And the reason I say try to get excited about is everyone's been super excited about these generative text models, generative image models. Um, Google launched Gemini as our new large language model late last year. And it's like this multimodal model. So it does text and images and sounds and everything in one, which is pretty amazing. And some of that's sitting behind Bard now. And that is amazing and that's cool. But as I said, when we're in education, Google fundamentally has made this really strong, firm commitment to the way we work in the education space and the products that we push into the education space have met incredibly rigorous standards. And so within Workspace for Education, we have been investing and embedding AI related tools for a long time and they're getting really, really exciting. I'm actually genuinely excited about some of the announcements that we're going to make at VET this week for what's coming in these tools. Um, but also we have things like Duet AI, which can be bolted onto Workspace and they are meeting our Workspace for Education um, terms of service. And I just want to call that out because it's really easy for us to just get super excited about the consumer stuff, but as educators and in schools, we obviously have that requirement to make sure we're, we're, we're ticking all of our boxes from a policy and governance point of view as well. Now, quickly, in the interest of time, um, we have um, principles. You can Google Google's AI principles. None of them, if you haven't seen them before, I'm shocked because we talk about them a lot. Um, but what I want to do is just jump quickly to like thinking about how these apply in education and then why does this all matter? So we've actually developed, and Chris said he'll share this with you, um, some questions to help think about applying those principles into the education context. So, um, you know, like just like I was talking about with our terms of service for education versus our um, commercial or um, uh, enterprise products, things like does it meet the requirements that you need to have in place? Is there sufficient control for leaders to be able to see what's happening in here? Does it provide you with visibility and insights? And these are principles, uh, questions that are based off our principles, but these questions kind of are really quite a good basis that you could be using to ask about any ed tech that you're moving into your schools um, as a sort of thinking about what's the purpose of it and is it actually not just being really cool because I was the first person as a teacher to just tick yes I have read and agreed to the terms of service of the tool that I was using in my classroom um, so not just that but it's actually also um, helping us to be uh, creating the best environment for our young people so why does all this matter in education and I'm going to do this Chris I promise in five minutes and I'll stop talking um, so I'm not going to do the full slide, Bill, but I want to just talk very quickly about this slide. So this is this concept that we have different layers when we're talking about education. So when we talk about schools, we have the physical structure of schools. So our timetables, our buildings, our people, our lessons. And this fundamentally really hasn't changed much and actually is probably the thing that is the most similar around about schools globally. Um, and this isn't super exciting when it comes to technology. And then when we move into education, we start moving to things like policies and systems and governance and our curriculum, our exams, our just-in-case content. So we teach you this just in case you need it at some point in the future, which is basically my entire year 12 maths curriculum, I feel, um, would fit into that space. I was an English teacher, so no bias whatsoever in that statement. But the bit that I get really excited about is when we start talking about learning, because this is the stuff that's really starting to change and evolve 
evolve because of technology. So Chris talked a lot about this last week, this concept of technology being able to transform learning from all of those variables. Remember, we've had them up on the screen. And when we start to tweak that, we actually change it. And technology has this incredible ability to do that. This idea of like the world is our curriculum just in time content. So um, exactly when I need to learn something, I'm able to access the content that I need to learn. Um, and then this super exciting space around um, AI personalized learning. And I want to give you um, an analogy that I think is one of the best um, to help thinking about if we want to help to make sure that the technology that um, can have an impact is having an impact in that learning space because it's going to really transform that educational experience for our kids, like with the activity that you've just sort of completed doing as well. Um, I love thinking about, well, where does that leave what technology we should pick and how we think about the role of the teacher in all this. So some of you have heard this story before, so I apologize, but this is one of my favorites. Um, Google has something called the Digital Future Initiative, something like $5 billion. I don't know, I always get that number wrong. I make up all statistics too, I shouldn't, I probably shouldn't have said that. Um, uh, $5 billion in Australia over five years, so maybe it's $1 billion over five years. Um, and one of the projects that we're doing in uh, NNS is actually a partnership with CSIRO, um, and there's a big um, preservation of the Great Barrier Reef. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is that this is about the, um, the process that CSIRO has gone through for a long time to protect the reef from one of the predators, the crown of thorn starfish. And what traditionally happened was the scientists got dragged behind the boat. They would try and find a crown of thorns. They would surface and say, hey, there's one back there. Another scientist would go and try and remove the crown of thorns. And part of this partnership with Google, they started using AI vision recognition technology to actually identify crown of thorn starfish and that's the image you see on the screen so this is the ai vision tool actually saying the likelihood that the things in these images are a crown of thorn starfish now for every one crown of thorns that our um, scientists used to identify the vision technology ai vision technology finds 20. now that's a great example of something that the ai can do better than the scientist and when we think about that in education what i like to think about is that there is lots of things that AI can do really, really well. And there's lots of things that it can't do nearly as well as us. And so when we think about this crown of thorns example, by allowing the AI vision technology to identify the crown of thorns, what we've done is we've freed up the scientists so we're no longer dragging them behind a boat to actually do the thing that they can do most effectively, which is go back into the reef and remove the crown of thorns with the incredible precision that they need to do it. So in our education space, thinking about where AI actually has the potential to support the teacher in doing things. In our Future of Education report, which some of you will have seen, probably none of you have read because it's really, really long, but the TLDR versions of it's really good. And there's a really good summary of it that's available as well. There is a slide though in the section around elevating the teacher that talks about um, how AI might be able to save teachers time. And this is based on the McKinsey uh, report. Um, and it was looking at things that teachers do that might be able to be reallocated to teach it, so to AI, and things that teachers do that would never be reallocated to AI. And the stuff that really matters that all of us who are or were teachers will tell you, like coaching with students and behavioural emotional skill development, like that's not an AI job. Like that's something that we teachers could have more time to do. They would they would lap up the opportunity to support um, young people more effectively. But things like administration and preparation and some of the evaluation, like AI can do that really effectively. I know I was a senior English teacher, the 20th essay I read probably wasn't getting my full attention or full objective feedback as the first essay I read, whereas AI never gets impatient or never gets bored. Um, and so potentially let's look at opportunities to reallocate some of that um, stuff to um, our technology. Yes, Darren Macalino. I know you don't like the numbers, but I did run the numbers on this report and it brings it down from 50 hours a week in total down to a normal working week of about 37 hours if uh, all the potential of AI is tapped, which is about a 25% saving. So it's nothing to sneeze at, but uh, interesting that it brings it back down to a normal And the interesting thing about well. it is, yeah, I don't like that because I think it's so variable. Like what I would save time in is so different to what you would save time in, but, and it takes it takes the time up 
to get to this point. And this is the thing with any new technology and movement, we know we have to invest ahead of the curve before we're going to feel um, the support. But there is potential for it to be doing some really incredible stuff. So what I'm going to finish with is this idea of, like, AI is here. <laughs> it, it's not going anywhere at this point. It's only going to get um, better at supporting us in our roles, I think. Um, and I do think that, if, Darren, you said that in 12 months' time, I really, because I'm sitting in the yellow quadrant from an emotion point of view, I really think that I would be able to give you a handful of examples from around the country where it's like, yes, I know that Julia as a teacher has done ABC this year and it's actually freed up X number of hours for her to do this that she loves doing and can only do as a human and connect with her kids uh, more effectively. But this is that whole concept I said about the concept of probable versus um, preferable um, future. So we know that there is all kinds of things when we think about the future. So we have the possible future, which is like what could possibly happen over time. Um, and like basically if we don't control any of it and we don't try to um, actually, I guess, play to our strengths and identify opportunities, then anything that's in that realm could happen. There's the plausible, which starts to narrow the funnel a little bit because the possible often, you know, incorporates a whole lot of stuff that is not within our control or things that might not fit into our particular context. And then we go down to the probable and the preferable. And often there's a bit of a tension between these two um, because the probable is the, well, I know all these things are already set in place around my school, around my system, around the way that we work, et cetera. And so probably this is where we'll end up going over the next 12 months. And what I'd love to challenge you to think about is how do we actually think about the preferable future and how can you as a leader actually in your school, in your system, help to frame the idea that if we can actually do the preferable um, by actually having helping to control uh, the way some of these things are rolled out, um, then we can have um, incredible impact. That's why I sit in the yellow quadrant most of the time um, when it comes to AI, because I really do think that there is um, incredible um, potential for this to really transform um, learning in a way that we haven't seen for ever, but we haven't really got really excited about technology in the last 10 years in relation to this as well. Now, I'm going to segue really well into what Darren's going to talk about in terms of what's new by just fin finishing with one final slide around where we're seeing some of this and some of the tools. I said, you know, about the yellow section with our workspace for education and how I'm really excited about some of the tools. We're making some really exciting announcements about some of the things that are on the screen this week, actually, as part of BET. And these are some of our advanced um, tools within Workspace for Education Plus that are really going to be underpinned very strongly in terms of their effectiveness and their impact by AI. Um, and one example that I'll just give you, um, because anybody who's ever heard me talk in the last probably two years has heard me absolutely bang on about Read Along, because Dia, the AI tutor in Read Along, is like my favourite AI person? Hmm, I don't think it's a person. Can't answer more flies. Hmm. AI tutor. My favorite AI tutor is called Dia. She's in Read Along. Read Along is this amazing app that we developed. Um, it's now, there's like 174 million um, books that have been read. It's, it's available in, I think it's like 29 languages. It's this incredible structure, um, support in learning to read. Um, and we're now integrating it into Google Classroom. And what, what I'm really excited about with this is that um, the app itself is really great, but what we're doing when we bring it into classroom is we're bringing it into this secure environment that is workspace for education, so it has all of the guardrails that we want in place for our young people, and it's actually able to give us these incredible insights into the progress of students' learning. And what Dia does, um, and I, I shouldn't say, uh, what the AI does <laughs> who happens to represent itself as Dia, a tutor, um, through Read Along, is after kids have read a few books with Dia um, in their Read Along app through Google Classroom, it actually starts to show you progress over time. But it does things like creates a word list of the 10 words that um, the child has sort of struggled the most with over the last five books. 
And as a teacher, you think about what would be required for you to actually be able to develop that list for every kid in your classroom. It's basically impossible. So we're starting to move up that SAMA model where technology is finally delivering on its promise of doing things that weren't possible without the technology. And that's really exciting um, and I'm really looking forward to seeing um, what comes next. So Chris, I'm pretty sure I only took my five minutes that you gave me. Yeah, yeah, that session. was the best 10 minute presentation you've ever done, Kimberly. That's awesome. <laughs> Good. Excellent. I'm gonna stick by see from my I'm stacked by perfectly, you know, into Darren's section. So exactly. Uh, and thanks. I'm going to hand over to Darren. But just before I do, I noticed in the chat, uh, Paul, you put a comment in there about uh, is it possible to, for us to offer some PD around all this um, AI stuff? Uh, in fact, we've developed a thing called the Bard Academy, um, which uh, we're thinking about running as a PD at some stage during the, the this year, hopefully sooner rather than later. Um, so keep an eye out for that one. And it's like a full workshop just diving deep into generative AI and understanding how that stuff is affecting uh, the stuff we do in classrooms. Uh, Darren, I will hand over to you, my friend. Uh, do you want to share your own screen? Yes, I can do that. No problem. Let me get that up. While Darren is doing that, can I just have a quick, uh, by, by, by show of emoji, thumbs up maybe, uh, how many people would be interested in like a Bard Academy, like an, a deep dive into AI of some sort? Okay, lots of thumbs up. So I'll take that as a, a positive. Cool, cool. I'm just going to flick through as it came to the front. Let me know when you guys can see that. Uh, we can see that. Oh, geez, we've got a lot of slides there. It's like... Um... Here we go. Found it. Yeah. Could keep going. Oh my this is, this is the, the rerun for anyone who was just... Yeah, that's right. Yeah. The absolute rerun. Um, awesome. All right. So, guys, here I am. I want to take you through uh, sort of some of the new stuff that's coming. Kimberly has already hinted at the BET announcements. If you don't know what BET is, it is running in, it's kind of like, I want to say the UK's Edutech, I guess is close enough, but apparently it's even bigger, which like blew my mind when someone told me that, like take Edutech and times it by a factor of 10. I was like, is that even possible to have that many people in one place? But anyway, it's happening in London in the next couple of days. So some really super exciting announcements um, coming through. Ah, CES, there you go. That makes more sense then. Cool. So um, if you guys haven't heard, we have a new tier of Chromebooks branded Chromebook Plus, which is super exciting in the sense of uh, we're getting a lot more sort of higher spec Chromebook machines um, that are really sort of taking it to the next level in terms of build quality, uh, accessibility and features as well. So have a look out for those. This is definitely um, an unashamed play for educators. So for a lot of educators, um, this is the kind of device that they will ideally be looking at. Um, to get going forward, but you get basic minimum specs um, included in that, that sort of guarantee a, a specific high quality experience. On this, fun fact, if you guys uh, didn't see on the news, but um, recently, based in Adelaide, where I am, there's a new player in the market called Allied Computers. Uh, they're actually a South Australian company and they've just been awarded, I think they're the 13th OEM manufacturer ever to be uh, able to manufacture Chromebooks and they're looking to assemble those Chromebooks in Australia and sell into the Australian market, which is really exciting. The other part that blew my mind was that they're able to do that at a cost price, which is competitive, if not better, than the major manufacturers like your sort of HP and Lenovo. So um, look out for that. Obviously, we support all of our partners, and um, we're really excited to see these guys come up. The question there, Paul? Chat's not working. Chat's not working? No, is it worth coming in and out, or did you have a specific question? Uh, you, you try putting something your in your chat. your chat messages are coming up in the chat, Paul. Oh, yeah, it's not coming up on the screen. Oh, sorry. Okay. No, it's my coming fault. through an outside, mate. My fault. Yeah. My yeah. fault. Yeah. Sorry. All, All good. All good. Cool. So that's Chromebook Plus. Um, there's also Cursive on Chromebook. It's been out for a little bit, but in case you weren't aware, if you do have a Chromebook or your kids have Chromebooks. Uh, there's the Cursive app, which is really fantastic if they have a stylus or even for uh, finger input to be able to do some more of that annotating work. So look out for Cursive on Chrome OS. 
This one as well, uh, for those who have used Screencast on a Chromebook, you are able now to share those screencasts to any other platform. So when it first launched, um, you might have known that you could only view it in another Chromecast app, so you'd have to be on a Chromebook. Uh, but now it's actually able to be shared inside of any browser window. So there's a, a built-in browser one there, which is- Hey, uh, Darren, can I, can I throw in a hot tip on that one? Um, some of you, who's used Screencast? Can I just have a wave at me or something? Oh, okay. hey, um, something I kind of worked out the other day, uh, we've got another app on Chromebooks called um, Chrome Canvas, which is just like a really plain full screen drawing pad where it gives you, basically a white screen. Um, and that's kind of what you're seeing there in that little screen capture there. Um, what you can do is open up Chrome Canvas and then open up Screencast on top of that and it gives you the ability to write and draw and make diagrams and stuff directly using Chrome Canvas, which then gets captured into Screencast. So um, yeah, if you combine those two tools together, it's a really interesting um, digital Canvas capturing uh, arrangement. Absolutely. And on the SAMR model, that's, I think, a great way to boost uh, the engagement even for the students on their own Chromebooks to be able to annotate their screens and you know, create instructional videos or whatever it might be as a, another piece of assessment, which is really, really cool. Uh, oh, Julie, right. in answer to your question, um, the, uh, Chromecast is uh, a Chrome only, a Chromebook only feature. Um, Screencast, yeah. Uh, screen sorry, screencast, I mean, screencast is a Chromebook yeah. only thing. Um, there are other things that do screen captures on other platforms that you can use. The The neat thing about the one in, in uh, the Chromebook is that it actually um, uh, captures your speech and turns it into text-to-speech on the side. So yeah. if you just need to capture the screen, there's every platform can do that. But the neat thing is we, we do the voice recognition on that as well. Sorry, I was a bit slow, Chris. I was actually uh, slow to ask my question. It was about cursive. Oh, okay, cursive. Uh, no, it's a Chromebook only thing. Yeah, it's Chromebook only as well. Although, was it? Is it separate from Canvas now, or it's just all in it's, Canvas? No, separate from Canvas. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, this one here, I'm excited about. Finally, for practice sets, you can import Google Forms Yay. into practice sets. Woohoo! Uh, so you'll be able very, very soon, if not already, if you have Education Plus or Teaching and Learning, um, you'll be able to bring all your existing uh, forms and import those questions with answers straight into it, which is really, really good. All right, uh, we've also got classroom analytics. So I don't, um, I Kimberly hinted at this one as well, but again, if this is rolled out to you now, it should pretty much be, I think, finished its rollout. Um, you have the ability to actually see across an entire class, how everyone's going, you know, have some analysis on grades. Um, and there's some also some fantastic features where if you, have the admin console settings uh, correctly enabled, you are able to enable classroom analytics across an entire school. So if, for example, you lead a certain year level, maybe you're year nine leader, you could see all of the analytics and insights from year nine Google Classrooms across that school all rolled up into one, which is brilliant. So I think that's gonna be a bit of a game changer. Take a little while to set everything up. Um, Great question, Paul, around Education Plus. The easiest way, and Chris and I have been working on uh, <laughs> get a, a simpler way, haven't we, mate? Uh, yes. but the easiest way, I think, is just to go to classroom.google.com and see if you have the resources page or more specifically whether you can make a practice set. If you can't make a practice set, you will not have Education Plus or Teaching and Learning. Yeah. Um, good question as well, Rosalie, around uh, Plagiarism Checker. So that is specifically not geared towards detecting anything AI generated. And the reason is because no one can do it well. So you're going to get too many false positives. So it's, it's not a, um, a lack of features. It's an intentional decision not to try and detect AI generated work because it's still a black box with uh, Gen AI. And it's very, very hard um, to effectively uh, bring that up. Yeah. yeah, I will. I will add on to that that there are some of our competitors in the plagiarism detection space that claim they can do that, mm. but they have an extraordinarily high rate, like more, way more than fifty percent uh, false yeah. positives. So it's, it's, it doesn't it's, fit in with our. It's as our, good as useless. Yeah. Correct. That's right. The, the the damage I think that you would do by you know false accusations, for example, over the few people or maybe perhaps many individuals you catch, it's it's probably on balance not worth it uh, with that kind of fail rate. So. Um, Julia, as well, for the classroom analytics customised to the faculty area. Yeah, so you, there's lots of uh, ways that you can set it up. Happy to take that offline if you like um, to talk about how you can do that. But basically, in the admin console, you can kind of create 
uh, sort of groups where you can you know see this entire group rolled up into one. So that's a, a really good feature with the analytics. Here's one, of course, interactive questions for YouTube videos in Classroom. Show of hands, anyone use that one yet? Or has it have access to that one built in in Classroom? Ryan's going up there, yeah, cool, couple of people. So this is something which is evolving rapidly and uh, we're not all under NDA here. So I'll, I'll just say, keep your ears and eyes open for the uh, BET announcements. Um, but this particular feature is getting better and better by the day. So at the moment, current capability is to add a YouTube video and to add questions in at different times of that video and multiple choice, open up some questions, um, and you can have sort of that basic one. So features called interactive questions for YouTube, um, but it's built into Google Classroom. AI use task submission in Google Classroom. Uh, we'll, maybe we'll talk about that one a little bit, uh, Rosalie. But this one here, like I said, keep an eye out. It's improving rapidly and you will see more AI features start to be rolled into this particular feature in Google Classroom as well which is gonna be exciting. Resource in Google Classroom, this is a very sort of straightforward one, but basically uh, you've got practice sets and YouTube interactive questions that are now kind of rolled up into a resources tab in your Google Classroom interface. And one of the brilliant things about that is it's making it more accessible in terms of sharing. So you can actually share practice sets via a link. Uh, and I believe at some point, hopefully with YouTube uh, videos as well, but what that means is you can essentially um, have sort of one resource bank and you can tag things and over time that'll grow into being more of a one-stop shop. So yeah. you can make a resource like a practice set that you can share out to other colleagues or use across multiple classrooms. And I just checked Aaron, the ability to share a YouTube interactive question set is in there right now. Fantastic, that's awesome. So. I think uh, this one might be one of those sort of sleeper hits. It might take a bit of time to build up, but you guys obviously you know, can imagine the, the power of, if you have a collaborative uh, school environment, you know, the power of being able to collectively build these kinds of resources and share them. Um, and for me, I also think about those uh, pre-service teachers or even those uh, early career teachers that come in and suddenly they have a bank of really high quality resources they can draw from. Cool. This one, so simple, but it's finally here. <laughs> you can excuse a student from an assignment. I remember when I was uh, uh, teaching that this was always something that uh, was a little bit of a frustrating point. But uh, obviously, the real world, things are messy and students miss assignments or they need to be excused from assignments. Maybe they're sick, whatever it might be. You can officially excuse a student and that uh, you don't have to give like make up a grade or readjust your entire grade book at the end of a uh, assessment period to make up for that missed assessment, which is awesome. Here's a little sort of niche one for you, but we've just released the ability to share a link to a specific time in a Google Drive video. So it's not a YouTube video, um, but a Google Drive video, which often uh, a lot of people use, you know, don't necessarily want to put it on YouTube. Um, fun fact, of course, you can, you know, post YouTube videos as sort of link only and whatnot. Um, but in this particular case, if you have a, a YouTube, a Google Drive video, I should say, you can copy a link to a specific time and it'll take you right there which is great. Another one, placeholder chips in Docs. We had, a, I think, a couple of people mentioned about um, using uh, chips in Google Docs. This one's great because it's just a placeholder, but you can clearly uh, create a structure or a template for what you want to be in a doc. So you can just say place, and then other people can come in the doc, click on the place, as you can see in the, in the GIF, uh, and add their own. And I'm not sure on this one, Bet you might know, but you may be able to turn all of that into a um, kind of like a template, like a building yeah, block. Yeah, you can turn it into yeah. a building block. Yeah, just select yeah, that. Right. Just select it, right click it and say, um, create building block. Yeah, and I think that's one of those ones again, where, you know, whether it's, you know, we talk about saving time, whether it's in the admin space for, you know, creating shared teacher resources, whatever it might be, it kind of can level up that idea of sort of templates. So you might not even need to do the, the templates as much if you're doing good blocks. Last couple of ones, actually this is the last one, which I'm, I'm keen to get some feedback on. You can now uh, solve maths equations with Smart Compose. So Smart Compose is kind of like your autocomplete. You've probably seen it in Google Docs, you start typing and it's like, do you want to finish that sentence? There is no admin control to turn this off. And I know when we first released uh, Smart Compose, it was a little bit of a thing for English teachers because it's just suggesting the completion of sentences or even longer paragraphs. So. Um, it's now able to do that. So 
Uh, yeah, I, I know what you mean, Rosalie. It's one of those things I'm like, well, is it just another way to cheat? Like if they're in a test, but in Google Docs, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Let me know. What, what do you think? Rosalie, do you want to chime in? What do you think? What, what makes you uneasy? Sorry, I had my microphone off. <laughs> what makes it uneasy, I guess, is that we're moving to BYOD for the first time year 7 to 12 this year. Um, there's a couple of staff members online I can see as well, Bindi and Diana from Pinny Point. Um, now, they're science teachers. They'll be using chemistry equations, et cetera. So it's always really good for kids, especially during COVID, when I was trying to do Google Meet and we were meeting up with the kids and getting them to type things. So I really appreciate being able to do maths type. That's that's a good thing. However, solving equations, this year I'll have the bottom year nine maths class. I'm pretty sure that it's just going to type it straight in there. Um, so, yeah, I, I think in terms of homework, like I do weekly homework, so mine might be something. Sometimes I do things like, um, you know, write 10 questions involving fractions and then I'll do the answers. That might work. Um, so that way they can use this to check that their question will give the correct answer. Um, I might flip it. I think that's what I might do. Mm. Yeah, and I see what you're saying. Don't um, do you have access to practice sets as well, Rosalie? I do, and I started using them at the end of last year. Um, yeah. And I really like that. I like the fact that, for example, and the head teacher Maths and I were talking about it, um, and we were saying how you can start typing in a question, and then it was throwing up. Say, if I was doing algebra, it was throwing up about five algebra questions, very similar, changing the numbers. Um, and, and giving me the four multiple choice answers. It did mm. save me a lot of time, I have to say. So there are a lot of positives to that. I did I did enjoy that part. Yeah, just thinking in terms as well, of, well, the simple things around like having a full maths keyboard. We won't go into it now, but, you know, there is the ability to do properly formatted and, and, yeah. and you know, same I was thing. Actually, I was actually going to mention to you, is it possible to have, you know, like a calculator on screen, you know, like with NAPLAN exams, you know, how we can pull down the geometry set and the calculator just to give them a bit more of a um, virtual experience of of what the platform would look like compared yeah, to right. an yeah. platform, can, you know what I mean? Can have a thing mm. that. Interesting. Well, for what it's worth, most, well, uh, Chromebooks definitely do and I'm pretty sure Macs and Windows do as well where you can just pop up a virtual ca uh, calculator yeah, from the operating yeah. system level. Yeah. yeah. Hey, uh, just before we finish that there, Daz, um, thanks for doing that. I uh, just want to mention there's, there's a, another little change that I noticed appeared in practice sets that's kind of undocumented, but when I saw it, I went, oh, that's super cool. Um, in a practice set where you type a question in and the AI will try and suggest resources and things for you, but occasionally you put a, set, a question in where it doesn't necessarily offer resources that are the ones you want, and so you can put your own in. So there's a new feature now. Uh, the the two types of things you can put in as a as a hint for the practice sets is a video. You can select your own video, or you can write your own hint. The little change that we made a couple of weeks ago is that now if you put a URL in the hint, it turns into a clickable link, which it wasn't before. It was just text. So now you could say, you know, if if a kid's struggling with a question, you could put in the URL and say, go and have a look at this link and like, yeah, you know, read up or whatever. So. Yeah. The little thing, but little uh, things. they all add up, don't they? Cool, cool. Yep. Do we want to give a couple minutes for feedback, Mitch? That'd be great. Um, thanks, everyone. That kind of wraps us up. Um, I'm just looking.